All right. It's not quite 3.30 yet, but I want to use the time before we actually dive into the talk to learn a, um, like a little bit more about you and your backgrounds. So please raise your hands if the following holds true for you. Who here is a front-end developer? All right. A few, a little bit of front-end developers. Who is a back-end developer? OK. Who would fancy themselves as full-stack developers? OK, so that's also the front-end developers. Uh, who among the back-end uh, developers, who's using Node.js for their daily work? OK. Who's using Java? OK. That's roughly 50-50. Do we have anyone who is neither using JavaScript or Java? Nobody. Oh, yeah, one person? Which language? OK, fair, TypeScript. Cool. Last question. Who has not heard about GraphQL at all yet? Who has no idea what GraphQL is? All right, everybody somewhat, OK, one person. So I hope that this talk especially caters to you then, because it's also very much an introduction uh, to GraphQL and building and deploying GraphQL servers with AWS Lambda and Prisma. <coughs> so let's dive into the talk. So my name is Nicolas Burke, and I work as a developer at a company called GraphQL. And we're a startup. We are based in Berlin. And we are building uh, tooling around GraphQL. And the latest product that we've built is called Prisma, which is kind of the glue between a database and your GraphQL server. And you're going to see how exactly it's going to be used when you're building GraphQL servers. And this is the agenda for today. So first, I'm going to start with a brief introduction to GraphQL so that we are all on the same page about like the, the core concepts of it. Then I'll talk about GraphQL server development uh, and, and the main mechanics that work inside a GraphQL server. Then I have a large practical part prepared where I'm actually going to show you how to build a GraphQL server from scratch and deploy it using AWS Lambda. And then in the end, I have one slide with a bit of the lessons learned for using Lambda with GraphQL. So let's start with the GraphQL introduction and the big question, what is GraphQL? So very briefly stated, it's basically a new API standard that was developed and open sourced by Facebook in 2015. But Facebook already started working on it in 2012, but only open sourced the actual specification along with a JavaScript reference implementation for GraphQL in 2015. And it basically is a query language for APIs. And, an, um, and it makes it possible to work against an API in a declarative way. It enables a declarative way of fetching and updating data against APIs. To really understand how it works, let's consider the example of a simple blogging application with the following profile screen. So on top of that profile screen, we would just have the first name of the user, then we would have a list of the posts that this user has written, and the last three followers of the user. So how would we tackle this situation typically with a REST API? In a REST API, we could design the API in a way that we would have three different endpoints, and these endpoints would cater the needs of that profile screen. So we would have the user's ID endpoint that returns information about a given user, the user's ID post endpoint that returns all the posts of a given user, and user's ID followers endpoint to return all the followers of a given user. If we now want to implement that profile screen on the front end, so for all the full stack developers here, how would you now tackle this with an API that is designed like this? You basically would have to go and make three different requests to these three different endpoints. So first, to get the first name of the user, you have to hit the user's ID endpoint with the corresponding ID of the user, and it would return some JSON data that might look like this, might look a bit different depending on how your API is designed, depending on how your data model is actually um, structured. But here we retrieve the ID, the name, the address, and the birthday of the user that we're accessing. And we can already spot like a small problem with this approach because right now we're downloading information from the server that we don't need at this particular point in time. We really only need the first name of the user, but we're downloading additional information. So that's not really a desirable situation. But at least we have access to the first name, and we can display it on the profile screen. Then we're going to hit the user's ID post endpoint, and again, potentially download a lot of additional data. We don't really know what we're going to receive from the server, but it could 
be more information for each post object, um, like the content or um, uh, potentially also the comments of that post. Uh, so again, we're downloading information, which is, go uh, which is going to slow down the performance of the app. Uh, it's going to make the entire um, network request slower um, and uh, is also putting weight on the user's uh, plan for data. But at least we have the titles of the post, so we can render them on the screen. And exactly the same situation for the followers endpoint. So we have the user's ID followers endpoint, get some JSON data back, and display the first names of the followers on the screen. So how would we tackle that same situation now with the GraphQL API? So the first and very important difference between REST and GraphQL is <laughs> that with REST, you usually have a set of endpoints, and each of these endpoints returns fixed data structures. So it's set in stone already what a specific um, what a specific endpoint is going to return. That structure is fixed. With GraphQL, we have a different situation because GraphQL APIs only expose a single endpoint and return flexible data structures. And the way how that works is that the client can decide what data it wants to request from the server. How does that look like? So here we have the same situation now with GraphQL where we would now go and send a GraphQL query that could look like this to the server. We're using, an, um, we're using an HTTP POST request and putting basically the query into the body of the post. And we can precisely specify here inside that query the data that we need from the server. So we say that we need the name of a user, the titles of the post of a user, and the names of the last three followers of a user. So we really can specify inside that query uh, the data that we want to request from the server. And at this point, you don't, have to, uh, you don't have to understand yet why we can put these words into the query. I'll talk about this a little bit when we're talking about the GraphQL schema. But it already shows you that we can precisely declare the data, uh, the, the data requirements on the client side, and the server is going to respond with exactly that data. So the response from the server might look like this. Again, we receive uh, some payload from the server uh, formatted as JSON. And um, the structure of the response, the structure of this uh, JSON object here, is equivalent to the structure that we saw in the query. So it has exactly the same fields that we were using in the query. User, name, post, title, follower's name are exactly the fields that we saw in the query before. So um, the client can basically predict the data and the structure of the data that is going to be returned by the server. And one way of looking at a GraphQL query, in fact, is to look at it as an empty, uh, basically as an empty JSON object um, where we only provide the keys but not the values, and the server is just going to do the job and fill in the values for, th for the requested keys. So it's a very simple and straightforward syntax to ask for data. And we get all the data at once, so we can display everything at once. We saved two network requests, and we also saved the, the download of additional data. If you want to learn more about GraphQL and why it might be good for you to use it, you can check out this, this blog article and then a more like thorough GraphQL introduction on a website that is called howtographql.com, uh, where you find a lot of uh, tutorials all around GraphQL. All right, so let's now talk about GraphQL server development. How can you build a GraphQL server that gives your client applications that much power. In general, no matter which programming language you um, which which programming language you are going to use, because you can build GraphQL servers with basically um, your favorite programming language is not it's not bound to a particular programming language. And um, no matter which programming language you use, you'll always find these three different parts inside the GraphQL server. And the first part is the structure. So that really is the GraphQL schema that defines the API operations. Then we have the behavior of the GraphQL schema, which is implemented uh, with uh, resolver functions. And then we have a network layer that takes care of just processing the network request, creating the response, and sending that back to the client. So let's take, uh, so let's take a closer look at each of these three components. So the GraphQL schema is strongly typed, and it's written in what's called the GraphQL schema definition language. So GraphQL has its own type language, that which allows you to write a schema and express the 
the, the data types that you're using in your application and also the different kinds of operations that your GraphQL server is going to accept. Maybe you've used a tool like Swagger before, and in Swagger, the correspondent um, tool to the GraphQL schema language would be YAML, because there you define the structure of your API with YAML. And it really defines the capabilities of your API, so it's a really strong contract for client-server communication. And the GraphQL schema has three special root types. So you can define various data types just using the GraphQL schema language, but there are three special root types which correspond to the different operations that are possible with GraphQL. So the first type is called query, and that defines the query, so it allows you to read data from the backend. Then you have the mutation type, and mutations define um, the operations when you want to make changes to the data in the backend. So if you um, so if you want to compare this with REST, there you're usually using post, put, and delete requests to make changes to the data in the backend. Here, the, the corresponding concept for that is mutations. And then you also have subscriptions, which allow you to use real-time data inside your apps. So subscriptions <coughs> also use the same syntax as queries and mutations, but allow you to subscribe to specific events and ask for particular data that is related to these events. Let's take a quick uh, look at an example. So here we probably have the most basic GraphQL uh, schema that you could imagine, where we're using the GraphQL schema definition language to define just this one root type, this one special root type called query. And this hello field is of type string. The exclamation mark means that the string is required. So whenever I request the hello field, it means that it has to return a string. It cannot be now. If we see a schema like this, we can derive from that schema the queries that we can send to the API. In this case, we really only can send one query, and that looks like this. We don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of possibilities because the schema is so simple. We only can send a query that contains the single field. And the response that a server might send looks like this. So again, a simple object where the key is hello, it corresponds to the field in the query, and the string that is going to be returned, um, that is um, provided by the resolver functions that we're going to take a look at in a bit. So let's take a lo look at a bit more useful example of the GraphQL schema, and um, let's see how we would implement or define the CRUD operations for a user type. So CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, Delete, and this refers to the common operations that you usually want to do with data. So first, we're using the schema language again to define a user type, so just a simple type with an ID and a name. Then the query type this time has two fields. The first field, user, allows to uh, retrieve one particular user, and the second field allows to retrieve a list of users. And to complete the CRUD API, we would add the create user, update user, and delete user mutations. And each of these takes a different number of arguments or takes, uh, takes a different set of arguments. Uh, for the create user, we only provide the name. When we're creating a new one, we assume that the ID is generated on the server side. Update user takes both to identify the user that is to be updated and the new name. And then delete user to delete a user with a given ID. If we now consider the user query of this GraphQL schema and think about what would a query look like that we would send to the API, it's very much the same query that we saw on the first slide where I introduced GraphQL, where we sent a user query that, that looks like this, where user inside the query is called the root field, and then we can add more fields to the query Actually, it's called the selection set of the query. So name is part of the selection set of the query, and user is called the root field of the query. And what we can put into the selection set is defined by the return value of the original field on the query type, because that is of type user. We're allowed to put the fields of the user type into the selection set. And the server might respond with data that looks like this. So again, it's important to realize that the structure of the query dictates the structure of the JSON object that is returned by the server. So now let's talk about resolver functions, because so far we only learned about like, the abstract 
way of defining the capabilities of the API in terms of the GraphQL schema, but we don't know how a GraphQL server now actually deci uh, decides what it is going to return for a query that is coming in. So this is done, this is the r responsibility of resolver functions. And they provide the concrete implementation of the API. And in general, you have one resolver function per field in the GraphQL schema. So each field that you define inside your schema will have one backing resolver, and that resolver is responsible to fetch the data for precisely that field. And that means basically that the process of resolving a query, of executing a query, basically comes down to just invoking all the resolver functions for the fields that are contained inside the query. So again, here is the Hello World example with our simple GraphQL schema on the left, and on the right we have a possible resolver implementation. So we define a JavaScript object that is called resolvers, and again, the structure of that object has to map to the structure of the schema definition. So inside the resolvers object, we have a field that is called query, and that again is an object that has a field that is called hello. And these two fields, they have to be called like this, because this is how we named the types and the fields inside the GraphQL schema. And then we just return a very simple string, the hello world string, um, for this resolver function. So when a query comes in, all the GraphQL server needs to do is invoke this resolver function for the one field that is contained in the query and returns the hello field, the, the hello world string. Let's take a, the, the same look at, at, at the same CRUD user example again. So here we have the CRUD user schema, and on the right now we have the resolvers. So again, we have the resolvers object that follows the structure of the, the GraphQL schema. So query, user, users, mutation, create user, update, user, delete user, user ID name. So for all of these, we now have corresponding uh, resolver functions. Each resolver function actually always receives four input arguments. A couple of these don't even use these input arguments, so I just have left them out inside the parentheses. And at most, we're using two, so we don't know yet what the other two ones are, but we're going to see those in the demo. Here we only see the root and the args field. <coughs> the args just carry the input arguments for the corresponding operation. So if, we took, uh, so if we take a look at the create user mutation, for example, this field takes a name argument, and on the right side, the create user uh, resolver function is using this name argument to create a new user. And in this particular context, we're just assuming the availability of a global DB, uh, DB object um, which uh, provides like an interface to a database. Um, so I've uh, put that there just for simplicity, um, in the real world, in your resolvers, you would actually go and have to write your SQL queries or access the database in whatever um, way you, you do. Um, and you might notice that the resolvers for the user type actually follow a very trivial pattern. So they receive this root input argument and simply return the ID and the name fields. So when you're actually implementing a GraphQL server, you don't have to explicitly spell them out. The GraphQL reference implementation that you're using is going to infer these resolvers for you, so you don't have to write that much boilerplate and only have to write resolvers when it makes sense for you. Then we have the network layer. So the network layer uh, can be implemented with a couple of libraries. In um, the demo, which I'm going to show, I'm going to use a library that is called GraphQL Yoga, which is built on, um, which is built on Express.js, which is a very popular Node web framework. And um, the network layer, of course, is also the, 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 the point where you put um, various uh, sorts of, like your network configuration, like the port or the endpoints that your server is going to expose. And it's also where you would configure any sorts of middleware if you use analytics, logging, or crash reporting, any sorts like this. This is <coughs> all part of the network layer. So if we put all of this together, the schema, the resolvers, and the network layer, imagine this now to be like a JavaScript file that is called server.js or index.js and defines the entry point for your server. Here we would have the GraphQL schema. It's again just the schema defined as a JavaScript string. Then we would have the resolvers, which we also already saw in the previous slide. 
And now we haven't seen code for the network layer, but basically the network layer could be implemented like this, where we import the GraphQL server class from the GraphQL yoga library, and then we simply instantiate a new GraphQL server with the schema and the resolver functions and start the server. And from that point on, we could go and send uh, GraphQL queries to localhost 4000. And that's precisely what I want to show you in the demo. So in the demo, I'm going to build and deploy a GraphQL server. And the goal is to build a clone of the Medium blogging API. Um, and in particular, we are going to implement the following operations. So for queries, um, the API is going to allow to retrieve a list of all the posts and filter for title or content. And it should also be possible to retrieve a single post by its ID. For mutations, uh, we are going to allow to create a new draft in the API. So each post will have a published flag. And as soon as that published flag is set to false, it's a draft. And once we publish the draft, then it's, it's a published post. And the published fla flag will be set to true. And we are also going to uh, um, implement an operation where we can delete uh, post, post objects in the back end. And this is the architecture that we're going to use. Uh, so today we're going to focus on the GraphQL server. Um, the GraphQL server can be deployed with Lambda. Um, for Prisma, which is going to provide the glue between the database and the server, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, we're going to use um, uh, Fargate later on, but at first I'm going to develop locally with Docker. And then on the back end, um, when you're using Fargate, you can of course use um, the um, AWS um, RDS uh, tools and use a MySQL database or something like this as you prefer. So let's go to the demo. Here is the code for the GraphQL server. And in the beginning, I really want to show you how a raw GraphQL server works. So for now, we are not going to use a database. We're not going to use Prisma. We're just going to focus on the raw functionality of a GraphQL server. So here is um, basically the GraphQL schema, which looks very similar to the schemas that we have seen on the slides before. So the post is our model type, basically. This is our data model. It has an ID, the title, content, and the publish field. Then we define three API operations, which is the posts operation, the create draft operation, and the publish operation. And since for now we're not using um, an actual uh, database, but only store the data inside um, an array in memory, uh, I have defined this post data array with one post object. So this has the ID, title, content, and published fields and then a little helper to generate unique IDs. And the resolvers, which I've set up at the moment, they correspond to uh, the structure of the GraphQL schema. So we have one resolver for the posts field. We have one resolver for the create draft field. In the create draft field, we simply create a new post object with the data that was provided in the arguments. And then we push this new post on our post data array and return it. And the same for the publish mutation here, we first need to find the post that we want to publish based on its ID. And then we set the publish flag to true and finally we return it. And in the end, we put everything together using GraphQL yoga. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what happens when we run this server. In fact, I want to show you this with a GraphQL playground. Who here has used a GraphQL playground before? All right, so for those of you who don't know what a GraphQL playground is, it's basically a GraphQL, sort of an, um, a sort of a GraphQL IDE, which you can use to send uh, requests to your GraphQL API. So you can send queries and mutations to the GraphQL API. And it comes with this um, auto-generated documentation on the right, um, which is generated based on the GraphQL schema. So the GraphQL Playground knows the schema of the API, and it, and 
and it is thus able to generate a documentation for you so that you can see the operations that you can send to the API. So here I see that I can send a query that is called posts, which I'm going to do now. And I'm going to retrieve all the different fields. And inside the playground, I also get this uh, auto-completion feature here, which is also only possible thanks to the GraphQL schema. I now click the play button, and the server now returns that one post, which I defined in the post data array. I can also go ahead and send a mutation to create a new draft. And again, I'm getting really nice uh, auto-completion features here. And here, inside the query, I can always dictate the data which I want to receive from the server. So, so here, I um, do the same for a mutation. And I can send a couple of mutations. And if I go back to the post query, I will see that all of these have now been added to the post data array with incrementing indices here for the IDs. And finally, let's also test the publish mutation for the very first post. So now we've set the publish flag of the first post to true. Let's send the operation, and we see that it's now set to true. So the current implementation of our GraphQL server kind of works, but everything that is happening is just happening in memory because we only have this array. Once we kill the server and restart it, all this data is going to be gone. But in any case, I want to show you a bit more how we can now further implement the API according to the requirements that we specified in the beginning. So I'm going to add by adding, uh, to start by adding the filter functionality here, um, where we can provide a search string to the query. And by the way, I'm doing live coding here. So if you see that I have a typo somewhere or anything like this, feel free to shout it at me because I don't want to go and debug in front of all of you. The first thing that we need to do to implement that filter is uh, to access the args object that is coming in here that is now going to carry the search string. And here I'm adding a test. If we have the search string, then we actually want to go and filter the post data array. And we want to filter it according to whether the title includes that search string or the content of the post includes that search string. And if we don't have a search string, because in the GraphQL schema, I defined it not as required. So if I did this, then this would mean that we couldn't send the post query without providing the search string argument. But because I'm leaving out the exclamation mark, it means that the search, search string is nullable. And that means we can send the post query without it. So we have to account for that case as well, in which case we don't filter and simply return post data. So here's how we implement the search string uh, operation. So let's go ahead and restart the server and see if it works. OK, first we see that um, we only have this one post because I restarted the server. Um, and now I can go ahead and provide a search string. Um, and if I do this, for example, then we just get an empty array back. But if I say QL, which is part of the title right here, then we get the post back. So the filtering seems to work. Let's now move on with the two other operations where we want to retrieve a single post by its ID. And we want to be able to delete a post also by its ID. Now I have to go and implement the corresponding resolvers. And in fact, when you work with GraphQL and you're implementing a GraphQL server, you'll always have this process. The first thing when you want to add a new feature to the API will always be that you have to go and extend the GraphQL schema with the corresponding types and API operations. And then you have to go and implement the resolvers. And that is also referred to as schema-driven or schema-first development. So now I add the post query right here where we also retrieve the arcs. And um, this time, everything we have to do is just 
call find on the post data array and compare each post's ID with the ID that was provided in the query, and that should give us the, the, the post or return now. And the delete post we're going to implement as well. <coughs> post and delete index. So here we are first uh, looking for the index of the post that we want to delete, comparing the IDs of every post. If we find this, then the post delete index will be greater than minus one, in which case we want to delete it from the post data array using splice, starting at the post delete index and re uh, deleting exactly one element. And in that case, we want to return the post which we deleted, and otherwise we just return now. Did anyone spot a typo or anything? Does it look good so far? Nobody, so hopefully it's going to work. So I'm restarting the server. I'm sending the query. Uh, that seems to work. Uh, let me go and create a couple of drafts here. So we only received this one because we still have the search string. If I remove the search string, then we should get all the posts which I just created with the mutation. So let's try if we can retrieve a single post with our new post query. Um, ah, posts. So here we receive this one post and the same for, let's test the delete post mutation. So we currently have a little bug in the playground where it won't reload the schema when I re restart the server, so otherwise it would also show me the auto-completion for these operations. So now I deleted post zero. If I go back to the posts query from the first place, uh, we see that it was deleted. So our API implementation works. All right, so far so good. We just built a GraphQL server that is able to store data in memory, which doesn't help us very much in real world applications. So in real world applications, you really wanna use databases to store your data persistently beyond the lifetimes of your server. And of course, the example which I've chosen for this talk is very, very simple. We only have one type uh, with a few fields, so this would probably also be relatively straightforward to implement with a database um, and to actually go and write SQL queries inside your resolver. But um, with GraphQL, um, or the, the core strength of GraphQL actually is that it also allows you to query deeply nested data from your API. So in a real-world application, this post um, this um, post model would probably have relations to other object types, such as, for example, a user type, uh, which could be the author of a post, or it could have comments. And then we could have a client that is requesting all the data for a post, um, including the author and all the comments that the author maybe has written. So it can really write queries that are deeply nested, go, deep, uh, go multiple levels deep in nesting. And implementing the resolvers um, for these kinds of scenarios can be super complicated and also has a lot of performance traps in the way how you're accessing the database, in the way how you're performing joins, or when you're using MongoDB, how you structure the, the, the database access calls. Um, and that's basically ex exactly the reason why we built Prisma as kind of a layer in between your database and the GraphQL server, which makes it super easy for you to implement the resolver functions. So now I want to show you how you can leverage Prisma to implement your resolvers. And the first thing that I'm going to do for that is simply delete everything that I have written so far because we don't need it. We now want to access a database inside our resolvers. So I'm commenting all of these out and commenting the post out as well. And in the GraphQL schema, I'm also commenting out the corresponding operations 
because if I tried to start the server and I defined these operations but didn't have resolver functions for them, then the GraphQL server would also throw me an error. So I have to put comments on all of these. All right, so now we have um, set up our application so far. And I quickly want to go back to the architecture diagram that we saw on the previous slide. So here you will notice that Prisma, as well as your GraphQL server, both expose GraphQL APIs. So when you're building GraphQL servers with Prisma, then you're going to deal with two GraphQL APIs. Why do we need two GraphQL APIs? Why can the client not simply directly access the Prisma API? Why do we need another layer on top of that? Think about it that way. When you're building applications today, you're also us usually having some sort of a database layer and an API, an application layer. And this is exactly the same idea that we're using when building GraphQL servers with Prisma. So Prisma basically just corresponds to your database layer. Everybody who has access to the Prisma GraphQL API can basically do to your database whatever they want. So this is not something that you want to expose to your client applications. Rather, what you're going to do is you're going to add another layer on top of that. Prisma also exposes a CRUD API, which basically is similar to um, like the APIs that you get from databases. So you can really do everything that you would um, like to do with the data. You have a lot of flexibility in the operations that you send. But usually, when you're building applications, you want to tailor your API more to the needs of your client applications. So you, you, you really want to make sure that the, the API that you expose um, is convenient for the clients that are going to access them in the end. So this is another reason why you would uh, use the API layer on top of the Prisma layer. And finally, if your application needs some sort of business logic, if you need transform data or validate data or integrate with third-party services because you have some sort of legacy system or you want to integrate a payment process with Stripe or something like this, this is all functionality that all goes into the GraphQL server layer and not into the Prisma layer because Prisma basically only is a way to access your database. So let's go ahead and start um, to create the database and the corresponding Prisma service in the first place. The way how I'm going to do this is by creating a new directory right here that I'm calling database. And inside the database directory, I'm creating two files which are the, uh, which uh, provide like the, the minimal setup that you need to get started with Prisma. So we have one file that is called data model GraphQL and one that is called, called Prisma YAML. Let's start with the data model.graphql file. So here you're going to use the GraphQL schema language again to define the structure of your database. So basically, um, in this particular case, I can just go ahead and copy over the post type because this represents the data model, but because this is now going to be processed by Prisma and translated into SQL tables, I can add special directives that indicate to Prisma um, special behavior of particular fields. So the add, add unique directive is ensures that we never have two post records inside the database that have the same ID value. And then I can also provide a default value for the published field right here which I'm going to set to false, so that every post that we initially create uh, will always be a draft. And so once I deploy the Prisma service, which I'm going to do in just a bit, um, this is going to be translated into an actual database table, um, but I don't have to write these uh, create tables uh, as SQL statements. I can just simply define my data model using the schema language. And the second file that I created is this Prisma YAML file here. And it takes a couple of properties. So first, I need to define the name for my Prisma service. Then I need to define a stage. So the stage can be just a random string, but usually you want to call it something like dev or staging or prot to um, represent the environment that the service is going to run in. Uh, then you have to specify the data model to tell Prisma um, what kind of tables it should create for you. And then finally, you want to protect your API with a secret, um, which is going to be used to generate uh, JWTs, which are required to access the Prisma GraphQL API. So this is now uh, kind of the minimal setup that you need um, to get started with Prisma. 
And I want to do one more thing. I also want to change this GraphQL config file here that we haven't talked about yet. So uh, GraphQL config is a standard for um, how you configure GraphQL files that is going to be used by various tools. For example, the GraphQL Playground. So here I'm now defining information about my two GraphQL APIs uh, to this uh, GraphQL config file, and this information later on is going to be used by the Playground. So at the moment, I already have the definition of my application layer of my app um, and the schema path, which is located in source schema GraphQL. So this is just the GraphQL schema that I have been, have been working with the entire time. And then I provide this extension with the endpoint. And now I want to add information about my second GraphQL API, which I call database, which corresponds to Prisma. The schema path for that is going to be in a generated directory. So this GraphQL API, I'm not going to write myself, but this is going to be auto-generated by Prisma. And as an extension, we're just going to add a Prisma extension and point it to the uh, Prisma YAML file. And this is all we need to get started with Prisma. So now when I want to deploy my Prisma service and use the Prisma GraphQL API, I need to run the Prisma deploy command. And it's going to ask me where I want to deploy my Prisma service, my Prisma API. And I have a couple of options here. So I can deploy it to public development clusters, which basically are a sandbox, a free sandbox for you to get started. So if you want to get started with Prisma, if you just want to try it out, Prisma is completely open source. So you can just deploy it to your favorite cloud provider. Um, or um, you can use these public development clusters just to get started quickly and play around with it. Um, then I have this Fargate cluster, which I have configured previously, which are which we're going to use in the end, but for now I just want to deploy locally with Docker. So now um, the, um, the Prisma CLI is creating a local, local, local service for it. Ah, I, haven't I don't have Docker running at the moment, so that should be the case if I want to deploy to Docker. <coughs> um, so, and the CLI, because of my choice, it also added this local uh, property because I chose the local cluster in the prompt of the CLI. It added this to my Prisma YAML file, so from now on it's not going to ask me anymore where it should deploy the API. So let's try it again. <coughs> All right. Um Do we have any questions so far? Everything clear? Yeah. Of the post query? Uh, here? Ah. Ah, so. Ah. Data model GraphQL, the post. In the schema file? Here? Ah, right. So um, here we are using two exclamation marks, and that um, so they refer to two different things. The f this exclamation mark refers to the list, which means that this entire uh, query can never return now. It will always at least return an empty list, but it won't return now. And the fact that we have this exclamation mark in here on the post element means that the elements inside the list can also never be now. So no matter what um, this query is going to return, the client can always be 100% sure that it's never going to be returned null. It's either an empty list or a list that only contains post elements, but never null elements. OK, so we see that something has happened here. We now have the development cluster. Um, and we see that it created this post type with all these different fields, and it, uh, and it also spit out this endpoint. And it also said that writing database schema to source generated Prisma GraphQL. So this is the file that I specified in the GraphQL config. Um, let's actually quickly take a look at this generated file because it now represents the GraphQL API of Prisma. So if I go to 
the query type, for example, we see that we have this post query, the individual post query, a post connection query, which allows us to do more um, advanced queries, like with aggregation and also more advanced approaches for pagination. Um, and in general, this API is a lot more powerful than the APIs than I have implemented before, because this is now really the interface to the database. It defines basically all the operations um, that you can send to the, to the database with GraphQL. And to just take a look at the mutation type as well, we have a create post, update post, delete post mutation, an upsert post mutation, and update many and delete many uh, batching mutations. So that's the API that's provided for you by Prisma with GraphQL. And if I now want to use this API, again, I can use a GraphQL playground. I'm actually going to restart it here. And in that playground, we now won't be able to access the GraphQL server layer, the GraphQL API layer that I've been using before because it's not running and I still need to implement it. But we now get the second project here on the left which is called uh, database uh, because that's what I specified in the GraphQL config file. Mm. And so um, what's really cool about this basically is that I now have a setup where I can access the API server and the database in the same playground and both with GraphQL. So if you think about it, it's somewhat like using a tool like Postman to send HTTP requests to your REST API and a tool like SQL Pro to interact with your database, both in one application. And I could now go ahead and write a query or a mutation here to create a new post. And in fact, I have prepared one, so I can quickly copy that over. So here is the mutation that I want to send. The API is a little bit different than the API that we design ourselves, just because this is the very powerful API that is now running against the database. So now I'm sending this mutation, and I'm actually creating a post inside the database, um, which is uh, configured locally on my machine. Um, I can also go ahead and send a query to check that this actually worked. Uh, not a mutation. published is set to false initially because we specified the at default directive. So now we see that the database layer is in place and now we have to go and implement the actual API layer. And that means we have to go and again implement the resolver functions. Sorry, here we go. So let's go back to index.js. And the way how we're going to implement resolver functions with Prisma is going to be very similar every time and we're this time going to use the two additional arguments that are passed into resolver functions. So I'm not going into too much detail into how these, um, how these arguments work, but the third argument, context, basically is a way for you to prov uh, provide initial information uh, to, the, um, to, the resolver um, uh, to the resolver functions, and the info object carries information about the incoming query. So I'll explain a little bit more what this, this means in a bit. Basically, what we want to do here at this point is we just want to access an object on the context that we call DB, which we haven't created yet, but I just want to write this implementation already. And on that object, we can now go ahead and um, basically invoke functions that correspond to GraphQL queries that are running against the Prisma API. So here, I just want to send the post query that we saw on the playground before, or which we just saw on the playground. So the invocation of this post function basically does the same as invoking or sending this post query against the Prisma API. But how does the, um, the GraphQL server know which fields it needs to put into the selection set of the query? So that's what the second argument here is used for. And I could, in fact, just write the fields which I want to retrieve here like this. But we um, because we want to retrieve these fields, uh, dynamically according to the data that is provided in the incoming query, we can actually use this info object which carries the information of the inco in incoming query as an abstract syntax tree. All right, so for this to work, we need to create this DB object. So let's go ahead and do this next. 
and um, we can create or attach things to the context initially uh, right here. And this time, again, I'm going to copy it over just for the sake of time and because that's a lot of typing. So what's happening here is that we're instantiating this Prisma binding instance. And I have to import that from the Prisma binding library, which I already added before in case we have trouble with the Wi-Fi. So I'm importing that from this Prisma binding package. And now I'm using this class and instantiate it with the following properties. So I pass the Prisma GraphQL schema to it, the one that was auto-generated. I pass the endpoint to it with the, let's see, what was the endpoint? If you ever forget the endpoint, you can print it with uh, the Prisma info command. Here is my endpoint that I need to provide. And then the secret is the one that is taken from Prisma YAML. And uh, um, uh, he's specifying debug as foo means that we are going to lock all the GraphQL queries which are going to be generated in, in the end uh, to the console. Um, all right, if I haven't forgotten anything, the posts query should already work. So we can go ahead and start the server again. It's running on localhost. Let's also go ahead and restart the GraphQL playground. So now we're back again on the application layer. So that is the same uh, GraphQL API that I built from the very beginning, where we have the post query, the create graph mutation published, and these rather simple operations, but at the moment only post because that's the only one that we have uh, commented in the code at the moment. And we see that basically now, when I send this query, what happens is that our GraphQL post resolver, the one in index.js, gets invoked, but rather than um, having to write any SQL here to return the corresponding data, I'm leveraging the underlying Prisma API um, with this binding here, and we see that the proper um, uh, data is returned. So let me go ahead and return the other operations. And the implementation is going to look very, very similar every time because now we just have to access the, um, the Prisma binding instance here, which which is the interface to the database. Can't forget the info object here. So here we are asking for a post with a specific ID. We are filtering with the where argument for a specific ID. And implementing mutations works in exactly the same way, except that now we are not accessing the query field, but the mutation field here. And we're using the queries and mutations provided by the Prisma API. So we have to provide data, uh, title, args.title, content, args.content, and provide the info object. Let's quickly uh, test this if everything works. So I'm removing the comment from the post query and the comment from the create draft query just to see if everything works so far. Restart the server. Uh, publish. Ah, so I removed the comment on publish apparently. Starting the server, going back to the playground and testing if we can now create a new draft. We created one new draft, two new drafts, Going back to the post query, these are now returned from the database, and we should also be able to retrieve a single draft with the post query. Um, I s arcs ID, all right, thank you. Um, and I also quickly want to implement the publish and delete post mutations. So here we are now returning context DB mutation. And from the Prisma API, we're using the update post mutation, providing information about which post we want to update. So this is args.id, 
and the data that we want to update is we want to set the published flag to true and again we pass the info object so that we know which fields need to be returned and then we also can implement the delete mutation in exactly the same way. Okay, so this is the entire implementation of the API. Uh, let me restart the server once again. Ah, I of course have to remove the comments here. Server is running. Let's move to the playground. Let's. So we sent the post query. All the posts have been persisted. So here, here they are still there. If I want to publish a post, I copy the ID of that post, go to the publish mutation, send it, and sending the post query again. This was now also changed like this in the database. All right. So the last step now is to deploy this GraphQL server. So what do you do when you want to take this GraphQL server into production? Um, a really neat way to deploy your GraphQL servers is to just use AWS Lambda. Um, and so I don't know who of you has used the AWS GUI for Lambda, but that's not super user friendly. So for this particular talk, I'm going to use a tool that is called App. That is just a very simple command line tool where you have one command inside your terminal that you need to call that literally is called App, and that is going to deploy your project to Lambda. But before I do so, I actually need to change this endpoint of my Prisma API. Because at the moment, my Prisma API is accessed locally. It's the one that is running on Docker. But once I deploy my application to Lambda, then this local host won't be available anymore. So I need to have some URL here that points to a Prisma service that is also deployed to the web. And for that, I'm going to use the Fargate cluster that I quickly mentioned in the beginning. So I'm removing the cluster property from the Prisma YAML file and invoke Prisma deploy again. Then this time I'm choosing the Fargate cluster. And there was already the endpoint for it. So I'm copying that and putting it here. So this URL now again is the Prisma API for my database. So I could go there, I have a fresh database and um, send the, the post queries uh, that we saw before. And now I'm going to use the up command. App expects a app JSON file in my current directory. I don't have that yet, but it has a wizard that lets me create it. So I'm choosing the default project name, the default AWS profile. And here for the region, I'm actually choosing the North Virginia region because that is where my Fargate cluster is deployed. And you want to make sure to deploy your GraphQL server in the same AWS region or data center where you also have your Prisma API deployed to really reduce the latency and don't have any um, performance um, problems on that end. And now it is deploying the server. So while it's doing that, that can take uh, up to one or two minutes. I quickly want to finish off with my slides. Here is the backup video in case anything goes wrong with the Wi-Fi. We we'll never know. So if you want to learn more about how to build a GraphQL server, then again, I can recommend to you a tutorial on howtographql.com. Um, or a bit of a shorter tutorial, which is directly on our blog. And we also have tutorials for deployment with the AWS tooling. So if you want to learn how to deploy GraphQL Server with App, which is the tool that I'm using right now, there's also a tutorial on our blog, as well as a tutorial that explains to you how you can deploy Prisma services, Prisma clusters to Fargate. Um, let's, before we move on to the lessons learned, let's see if didn't deploy yet, so we're going to move on. So on the plus side, when using AWS for deploying GraphQL servers, it's super easy and super fast to deploy your GraphQL servers in the first place. Um, and you also get all the benefits of the integrated security model and the compliance that comes with AWS Lambda. So it's compliant by default with all these regulations like GDPR or HIPAA. Um, you can use these nice uh, deployment tools like App, um, and it's very, very cost effective, of course, to run your servers with Lambda as well. The only real downside when you're using Lambda for deployment of your GraphQL servers is that they cannot handle real-time subscriptions. The reason for that is that subscriptions are usually implemented with WebSockets. 
And the way how they work is that clients have to subscribe to specific events on the server side and open connections. That means, again, that the server needs to maintain these connections. It needs to maintain state where it um, stores uh, which clients have subscribed to what operations. With Lambda, we cannot deploy stateful applications because Lambda um, will is going to tear down the instances once they are not needed anymore, and all the state that you stored there is is breaking. So, an alternative to, to that, if you need uh, real-time subscriptions, then you can use Fargate. All right. So it was deployed. Uh, I forgot one thing, and I don't think. Uh, so I forgot to add a start script to package JSON. So if I now open the URL, we're only going to see an internal server error. Let me quickly add a start script. So this happened last week in Cologne already. Um, and I haven't learned from it. I have to deploy again with up. So at the moment, we only see this internal server error because the AWS Lambda server didn't know how to start the server. That's why I added the start script. Um, I have one more slide, and then we see if the deployment works. So if you want to learn more about GraphQL, we are um, actually going to organize a conference uh, in June, on June 15th in Berlin. Um, and it's uh, the, the biggest GraphQL conference that's happening in Europe, and we'll have the creators of GraphQL from Facebook as speakers at the conference. So it's really a, a, a good opportunity to get in touch with the GraphQL community and learn more about uh, the, the entire ecosystem. Hopefully, it gets deployed. So I don't want to keep you much longer. If you're interested that this actually works in the end, you can come up afterwards to me. And that is all I have. Thank you. <laughs> and maybe we can take one or two questions. I can also understand if you want to go out in the sunshine, so. All right, thanks. Hey, yeah.